स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया गुड मॉर्निंग वी बिगिन वी कंटिन्यू विथ फ्रेंच मास्टर्स एंड आई एम गोइंग टू बिगिन विथ जॉन रेनुआ जॉन रेनुआ एंड वी हैव ऑलरेडी रेफर टू रेनुआ इन वन ऑफ आर अर्लियर क्लासेस ही वॉज द सन ऑफ द फेमस पेंटर ऑगस्टिन ऑगस्ट पेयर ऑगस्ट रेनुआ <clears throat> he also has an important part in in uh, the rules of the game that the movie that we are going to discuss today along with his other celebrated films so uh, jean renoir 1894 to 1979 and he is considered as one of the most uh, formidable influence on the entire french novel vogue the movement called the french new wave okay so he is considered the pioneer in many respects so what if someone asks you what is the place of renoir in cinema he influenced a very important very influential movement called the french new wave and you should know along with italian neo realism are you aware are you familiar with the concept italian neo realism i keep on referring to these terms on and off along with italian neo realism French Nouvelle Vogue is one of the most important influences on uh, American counterculture cinema, the new, so-called New Hollywood. So all the Scorseses and Coppolas and Brian De Palmas, etc., they owe and they are indebted to French New Vogue and Italian New Realism. Okay, when you watch their earlier films, you will understand that how. Uh, important these people were on their on uh, uh, entire cinematic movement in new hollywood so truffaut another important uh, filmmaker of the french nouvelle vogue uh, francois truffaut who made films like 400 blows another important film by truffaut i am not going to discuss truffaut in detail because i feel many people in our course they know truffaut quite well 400 blows especially but any other film by truffaut that you may recall good jules say jim yeah what did you say ranjit no i said la dolce vita la dolce vita la dolce vita is an italian film by by fellini yes good okay so uh, you talk truffaut you should talk about jules say jim day for night day for night bed and breakfast 400 blows of course so truffaut called renoir's la regle de jou a movie made in 1939 and we are better familiar with it as the rules of the game at the credo of film lovers the film of films the most despised on its release and the most valued afterward and we'll see why it was most despised when released in 1939 it usually happens with certain kind of films which are very despised uh, when they are first released but later they become like a classics people refer to them as textbooks director robert altman does it does the name ring a bell good mash not the alan alda television series but the movie donald sutherland so he is known for mash he is also known for macab and mrs miller okay with warren beatty and uh, julie christie you must know all these films macab and mrs miller robert altman okay so who is gosford park in 2001 starring maggie smith was inspired by renoir's classic um, one said i learned the rules of the game from the rules of the game okay so 
he was that inspiring and Robert Altman is of course, one of the uh, few people who are credited with ushering in of new Hollywood in Hollywood in American cinema. So, um, what are his signature styles Ren was? He is known for his uh, humanism, poetic realism is his style, the way he would shoot scenes, but uh, the one nature, one aspect of his cinema is his humanism, his liberalism, which is uh, something you would not find uh, very strongly in Godard for example. Godard is very technical, okay. Godard is objective, but Truffaut is not. Okay. So, Truffaut was directly influenced by people like Renoir and Renoir is known for his humanity, his humanism and in depth evocation of milieu, subtle realism as we have just watched in depth evocation of milieu. Okay. He would understand classes, all classes of people extremely well and he had sympathy for all, never judgmental. We have already discussed that Renoir who was born uh, in 1895, his birth coincides with the birth of cinema itself. So, that is important. So, Renoir's films, what are they, how can they be classified or categorized? They range between social realism and fantasies. Of course, they are love stories, of course, they are pieces of works of fiction, but they are also uh, uh, deeply grounded in social realism. He is called poetic realist and I, we were talking about how Satyajit Ray assisted him when he was visiting India while shooting the river, Renoir's first film in color. Okay, and Satyajit Ray gets his style poetic realism from Renoir. Okay, and a deep concern for the human condition. So, the term poetic realism denotes a period between 1933 and 39 and implies a certain mood, tone and style. The term was coined by literary critic Jean Paulin and is used to describe the mix of symbolism and realism, which Jean Paulin found in the novels of Marcel Aimé. French novelists. So, uh, what is Renoir credited with? See, today it may not appear so startling, so innovating, but uh, uh, there was a time when uh, uh, shooting on locations, on actual locations, and often using non professional actors was uh, something unheard of. So, uh, that is what Renoir is credited with experimenting with the long take rather than tight close ups, which was uh, uh, very common during those days, because actors used to be so beautiful and the only way you can get very close to your favorite star actor is by looking at his or hers, how? Close up, right. So, that was very star driven, close ups also have an ideology. Okay. You use uh, a close up of Cary Grant or you employ a tight close up of someone as, a, as beautiful as Audrey Hepburn and what are you doing? You are bringing that star very close to the audience. Okay. So, close up has a politics, has uh, an ideology in uh, uh, especially in our cinema, in Indian cinema it is very common. We use close ups for no reason, no particular reason. You must have noticed that there are close ups all over the place, okay, because audiences want it is almost like you, you can reach out and touch your favorite star. Renoir on the other hand employed long takes and also started using deep focus compositions. Now, what are deep focus compositions? You look at something which is foregrounded very clearly. You also look at something which is in the background, which was previously neglected. 
So, background was neglected, but people like Ranua use deep focus, so that attention is also given to those things which are present in the background. And who perfected this deep focus? Who do we associate deep focus with? Not with Ranua. Ranua is known only to film academicians and film students like you guys, but um, this is someone who everyone knows about. Citizen Kane, Orson Welles, he perfected the art of the technique of deep focus. Okay. One of these days we will discuss Citizen Kane also, if you wish. Okay. So, deep focus compositions credited to Renoir, perfected by Orson Welles. And of course, use of multiple cameras for the first time and color in films. The way he used colors in cinema and multiple cameras. You know, generally films are shot with one single huge camera. People like Renoir started shooting the films, the same shot with using multiple cameras. What effect would, do you think that would have led to? Multiple cameras, different angles, same scene shot through different perspectives and angles and what effect? What Ultimately, it would result in taking the best shot, best composition. Okay, lot of effort for the editors, but lot of fun as well. Okay, so it film was not films were no longer shot with just single camera, but multiple cameras so that multiple angles can be captured, and then the editors would use whatever they thought was best for them. I mean, I have seen rushes of three idiots. You know what's rushes? What's rushes? Uh, all the footage that they showed, but most of it doesn't actually go into it. it exactly, all the footage that is actually shot, <laughs> but doesn't necessarily go in the actual movie. The way we see, watch it, uh, Shrika Prasad was with us, and he showed us uh, footage of Kamine, which he edited. So uh, at FTII, we were shown footage of uh, three idiots. And uh, you remember the scene where Amir sits in a class for the first time and he is very excited just to be in an engineering college and then he is asked to define what is a machine. Yeah, and that scene we were, we, we were made to watch through multiple perspectives. Okay, so, there is a shot when the focus is only on Chatur, there is a scene where, where the focus is only on Madhavan and then completely through the professor's point of view and then and in the final an analysis we were taught that they used a combination of all perspectives. So, it was not just focusing on Amir or Madhavan or Chatur. Okay. So, they must have done lot of editing there. So, that is what I was talking about. We have already uh, become, uh, we have already seen his major films, La Chien, Bado saved from drowning, a day in the country, the crime of Monsieur Lange, La vie est à nous, and very popular La Bête Humaine, based on a novel by Emile Zola. Emile Zola, one of the pioneers of the naturalism theory. Jean Gabon was a, a frequent collaborator. It was the kind of actor-director partnership that later you will witness in uh, people like De Niro and Martin Scorsese, or Di, uh, DiCaprio and Martin Scorsese. Now, okay, so uh, it's that kind of a combination. So uh, uh, Jean Gabon was a favorite of Renoir. They often worked together, and also. Truffaut and his actor, the child actor and when the child actor started growing up, Truffaut was, Truffaut um, would invariably cast him in all his films. So, Jean Gabon and Simon Simon in La Bête Humaine. Um, has anyone seen a movie called, I am talking about the first version, not the remade version, The Postman Always Rings Twice. Are you familiar with it? No, Heard of it? No, no, I am talking about John Garfield and Lana Turner. Hmm? 
So, the postman always rings twice is based on whose novel? I will give you another clue, okay. <laughs> definitely literature is not a very strong point here. I okay. will give you another clue, this author is known for his noir works. I would not insult your uh, intelligence and uh, explain to you what is noir, you know what is noir, right. But uh, um, this particular novelist was associated with the genre of noir, he wrote the postman always rings twice, he also wrote Mildred Pierce, first made with John, uh, Joan Crawford and now of course, with Kate Winslet, that is a mini series, but there was an Oscar winning movie, Mildred Pierce. Who wrote it? Familiar with Mildred Pierce? Watch the movie, at least Winslet's version. Yeah, please watch it. Very entertaining, very pulpy novels. James M. Cain is the novelist we are talking about. So, La Bête Humaine, although based on a novel by Emile Zola, and if you watch the movie, uh, the movie you will feel that it must, how it must have influenced John Garfield's version of the postman always rings twice. Again, it is about uh, 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 an adulterous relationship uh, <coughs> between, would you like to go out and drink water? It is uh, about an adulterous relationship between a married woman and her lover who is an engineer, a railroad engineer and uh, her husband and um, she wants her lover to kill her husband. In the postman always rings twice, they do kill the husband, right? Yes. Um, in uh, uh, La Beth Human, the lover refuses to do so. So, um, the woman, okay, she is quite a farm fatal and you know the qualities of a farm fatal and she detaches, she distances herself from her lover. She says, if you cannot kill my husband, I do not want anything to do with you. He, he is heart broken, he is truly a jilted, mad, in love kind of a lover and he seeks revenge. Uh, there is a scene uh, somewhere in the middle of the movie, where these lovers dance to a particular romantic song at the railroads. So, it is a very famous song, a French song. Now, after being jilted by the woman, the lover goes back to her house and strangles her to death. And again, we hear the same song playing in the background. Now, this was something like, now perhaps it is not very uh, uh, uncommon today, okay, to have something, you know, to include, someone the other day was mentioning how Kamal Hassan uses animation in Ala Vandan, okay, while shooting very gruesome, a serial killer, okay, but then there is a comic effect brought in, right. So, it breaks uh, the kind of na traditional narrative, right, when you include animation to portray serial killing, then you are going away, breaking away from the traditional narrative. Here too, using a romantic song while a murder is in progress was highly innovative during those times. So, Renoir is credited with similar innovative techniques, okay, sim similar very experimental kind of uh, narratives, which may not seem very unusual today, but they were innovative those days. Okay. And he does not evoke any sympathy, feelings of sympathy or pity for the lead characters. The song, which is a classic to which they had once danced and now he kills her to the uh, background of the same song, uh, it evokes a feeling of nostalgia. Okay. It does not evoke pity. So, Renoir's sympathy for ordinary people, however flawed, is most evident in two of his masterpieces, apart from uh, uh, La Beth Human. One is The Grand Illusion or La Grande Illusion and 
the rules of the game. In the 30s, Renoir formed a company, a film company called Les Nouvelles Editions Francais. And when he formed the company, he announced that his next film would be an exact description of the French middle class. One of the characters you just watched in a clipping from the rules of the game is played by Renoir himself. He plays the role of, he plays the part of Octave okay, and that is Renoir himself. And he, there is a famous line which he mouths, the terrible thing about this world is that everyone has its reasons, as has his reasons. So, the terrible thing about this world is that everyone has his reasons. It could be her reasons also, there are no disputes about that, okay, his reasons, her reasons. What does it mean? Everyone has their reasons, okay? it is a terrible thing. What does it mean? Think of Renoir's other characteristic features, you have been talking about his social realism, his humanism. Does it say something about that? Yes, tell me. Common to everyone, I mean everyone has some reason of doing something. Okay, so, there is a reason. What kind of a filmmaker does he emerge as then? Liberal? Yes, okay, so his liberalism comes across and it is very ironic, uh, very telling that the person who mouths these lines happens to be Renoir himself, that everyone seems so, it is a murder, it is a, uh, 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 but it is a murder for love as in the Beth human. If someone is greedy, okay, they must be having their reasons. So, sympathy for everyone understanding of every class, no judgment, no looking down on people, that is a hallmark feature of Renoir. Can you think, can you draw parallels between Renoir and some of our own cinema? I mean, one of my colleagues the other day, he was uh, just making a point that our cinema is extremely judgmental. Our filmmakers always go into the preaching part of it. Whereas, uh, uh, more international cinema, okay, they just show, but they do not go in, into extensive explanation of things. Do you agree? We do have a sense that our filmmakers take a moral stand and there is too much of preaching and judgments. Do we agree to that? To a large extent. They do that. But there are exceptions. Mm. Name them. Maybe in Gangs of Vasipur, how they present the different characters. Yeah, but when was Gangs of Vasipur made in 2012? Okay, we are talking about someone who was making films in 1930s. Okay, so gives you know a lot of food of th for thought. Okay. So um, the rules of the game was based on a short story by. Alfred de Musaw and it is a cautionary tale. It is a humanistic tale of course, but it is also a warning about the frivolity of the idle rich at a time when France was on the verge of war, the, uh, the second world war 1939. So, the movie is now analyzed as Renoir's take on the self-absorbed class. At the same time, it indicates his uh, liberalism and his humanism as well, because everyone has their reasons. When the film was first released, people protested outside the theatres, because of the ideology, because of the way he, com he, he made his social observations, that uh, uh, people are essentially self-absorbed selfish and people did not like, the ordinary audience did not like this kind of philosophy. What do they want? Feel good cinema, right. 
as always okay, if you show too much of a stark reality people do not like it. So, there were protests outside the theatres and it was banned in France for very long time for being very demoralizing. Okay, it broke their hearts to see the reality on screen. After all, you, you have uh, Renoir showing that the mistress of the house is having an affair and the maid is all no different. And then, how the mistress's lover is killed in an accident by the hus mistress's husband, okay. the man who is the aviator who proclaims his love for the lady. And internationally, it has influenced several films. If you uh, remember the great escape, so the tunnel digging scene and the singing of the Marcel in Casablanca to infuriate the Germans. So, both are you know homages to Renoir. Renoir wrote his autobiography, My Life and My Films where uh, discussing his technique and his beliefs, he says, I got nearer and, and nearer to the ideal method of directing, which consists in shooting a film as one writes a novel. The elements by which the author is surrounded inspire him, he absorbs them. So, a writer in other words or a filmmaker in other words derives from what he is surrounded with. So, therefore, when we talk about Renoir's realism, we are talking about how he was inspired by locations, people, incidents around him. He also says in the same autobiography, an artist only exists if he succeeds in inventing his own little world. And uh, that is true of most artists, they fi find their exclusive niche and stick to it, okay. so their own little world. We were just referring to Renoir's partnership with actor Jean Gabon and Gabon appeared in three of Renoir's uh, classics, La Bas Fonts, La Grande Illusion and La Beth Humaine. And then he also wrote his father's biography, Renoir, my father, based on his, uh, based on the life of his father, Pierre August Renoir. Okay, uh, as homework, please uh, try to watch uh, the rules of the game, if possible. And if that is not possible, then try to <laughs> read as much as possible on the rules of the game as well as La Beth Human and The Grand Illusion, his three masterpieces. They are all very entertaining. You would not find it very difficult to sit through them. And one of his uh, later films before the river was uh, uh, French Cacon, which is uh, an act of homage to the show business. So, it is based on the lives of people in show business, the French can call. So, I will proceed if you do not have any questions on Renoir and then because Renoir is where we were just talking about he was the first to employ non-professional actors. Now, what is the meaning of non-professional actors, people who are unprofessional behave badly, <laughs> exactly, who have never done any formal training uh, in acting and also who, ha who are not much exposed to acting, who have not acted before. So, employment of non-professional actors, this is another feature which the new Hollywood borrowed extensively from uh, the French new wave. So, Renoir of course, was the pioneer and then people like Truffaut and Godard took it to another level. Of course, we also know famously uh, the actor who played the lead role in the bicycle thieves, the Sicha's bicycle thieves. He was also 
a non professional actor okay and uh, in william friedkins does he mean anything to you good the exorcist uh, he employed a real priest uh, who was a non professional actor not the main, main role but uh, one of the supporting roles for uh, one of a key role so french novel vogue and when we talk about french new wave we should also be uh, familiar with the author theory and author theory you will understand much better if you read um, andre bezon's theories on what is cinema okay so one of these days when we start discussing the theory part of this course more when you have to make your presentations perhaps some of you can opt for discuss uh, uh, for a discussion of what is cinema and directors as we were talking about when we started this course the directors were considered as authors and authors so um, let me go back again to one of our earlier classes what is an author according to the new wave cinema who according to you could be an author please focus on them director whose films can be read like a text okay uh, elaborate to become an author what are the things that people should do he has his own he or she has his own signature style or something which can be seen in all of his work okay okay that comes later a signature theme a signature style uh, hitchcock had a signature style right so when french new wave people started developing this particular a so called author theory much debated much debunked theory okay you don't have to take any theory um, on its face value every theory is contested so when people when french theorists started discussing author theory who did they take in consideration not their own people but hollywood directors and who were the hollywood directors who most influenced them please loud and loud orson welles okay orson welles is a textbook for everyone a citizen kane a 1940 movie john ford the man who made all those great western with uh, john wayne who else hitchcock hitchcock was an author for the french new wave uh, theorist theorist and filmmaker so hitchcock was important and also Howard Hawks now Howard Hawks some of you may not be aware of Howard Hawks but uh, it was one of the greatest ever can you mention some of his films 1932 yes scarface 1932 paul muni starring now al pacino's version came much later but the original scarface was by howard hawks what else since our friend just said that uh, an author should have a signature style so what what other movies did uh, howard hawks made bringing up baby with the uh, cary grant his girl friday again with cary grant um rio bravo with john ford none of these films have the same theme one is an action movie the other is a western and there are several romantic comedies okay. still howard hawks was considered an author because uh, he had a certain style and because so authors were not considered authors only because they had a certain Uh, thematic ru thread running through their oeuvre they were also considered important because they had a certain degree of control over their materials so it was not it's a very simplistic way of saying that authors would always use the same actors 
authors would always use the same uh, technicians, the music director, the cinematographer, that is there, but that is not the main thing. Authors, the most important feature was that the authors were supposedly in complete control of their product and what is the product? Cinema, their film and what could be uh, better, uh, what could be having better control over their product than writing their own scripts. So, that was very important. They wanted complete control over writing their scripts, dialogues, screenplays, although it was normally done in collaboration with someone, because one man cannot do anything, but uh, everything by himself, but they would like to have control over the way the film was written. So, it was not as if anyone can give them a bound script and then ask them to write a to make a movie out of it, it, wa it was not done that way. They had complete control over the uh, other aspects of filmmaking. Okay, so, that is authorism and some of the best known films, 400 Blows by Truffaut, Breathless by Godard, Band Apart again by Godard and several others. Okay, so, uh, the author theory was developed by Andre Bezon, a very important film critic and his disciples. Now, disciples also happen to be film critics and then they decided that if we criticize so many movies and if we are so unhappy with the way films are made, then why do not we make our own films, our own kind of film, which was like a breath of fresh air for French cinema, which was almost dying at that point. So, some important names along with Andre Bezon, Truffaut, Godard, Rene. Rene made a, a classic called Hiroshima, My Love, Ma Amour, and Last Year at Maryaba. That is another, when we talk about repetition and narrative in narratives, then we will be discussing last year at Maryam Bound. Did I ever discuss that film with you, with your group? Perhaps I did in one of my earlier classes. So, Rena's last year at Maryam Bound is a, an important movie by way of its narrative, telling the same incident over and again, which was later done to perfection in in vantage point. Good vantage point, yes, but uh, there is another classic. Rashomon is uh, yes, yeah, multiple perspectives, yes, good. Uh, so, Rashomon, uh, what else did you mention? Vantage, vantage point, point, yes. In between, there was something Bill Murray, oh, Groundhog Day. Okay. So, those are the films that you should we will be discussing when we talk about narrative and repetitions. So, Rene's last year at Mariamba. Tell me, any comments here? Uh, Christopher Nolan said parts of Inception were influenced by last year at night. Of course, yeah. It is a very dark, edgy movie, although Nolan's movie is a thriller. Okay, It has action, it has great special effects. Last year at, at Mariamba is, is an out and out love story based on a novel. Again, uh, Nouvelle Roma, uh, the new kind of novel. So, and Claude Chabrol, Romer and Louis Mal. So, these were the people who ushered in the era of French new wave. And as we were just talking about, the manifesto was the director was the real author of a film and not the studio. So, it was in other words a revolt against the entire studio system, which is something you will find, uh, which something happened in the 60s in Hollywood with Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie and Clyde and the subsequent next 10 years, they were the so called new Hollywood. Okay. And when you had films like uh, William Friedkin's Exorcist, but Exorcist is more conventional. Before Exorcist, there was the French connection, which got him the Oscar, wonderful movie. So, the author or the, act, uh, the director is the star of the film, that was the idea, not the actors. Therefore, insistence on 
having non-professional actors. In Hollywood, there was a director made three great movies. I will ask you his name and he was very insistent. He is also a great film critic, okay, but that is another thing. Um, he made three movies uh, which were all classics and after that there was a constant downhill, downfall and he insisted that film that the director is the real star, the hero of the film. Okay. And uh, he, he would very consciously take only those people, uh, insist on having only those stars who were by and large very uncharismatic, because he did not want anyone to overshadow his powers. I will give you the titles of this, his films, if I can remember all most of them and then you have to give me the name. He made the last picture show, yes and Sybil Shefford. Then he made Paper Moon with Ryan O'Neill and his daughter Tatum and then in between he made What's Up Doc, Barbara Streisand, three super successful and critically acclaimed movies and then it all went to his head <laughs> and then there was a constant downfall. Peter Bogdanovich, okay, so director being the star, insisting that the director should be the star. Peter Bogdanovich. Similar thing happened to Paul Schrader also. Paul Schrader, the screenwriter for Good, Taxi Driver, and also the director for Well, do your homework. Paul Schrader, what did he do? Okay, what is his contribution? Because because uh, again like Bogdanovich, he could not su sustain his success. Again like William Friedkin, who made the French connection, got an Oscar, okay, then followed it up with a very successful The Exorcist, okay, but could not follow. I mean after that there were nothing. So, pitfalls of the authorism, okay, when directors start asserting too much control over the product, it is all very good on paper. But there were pitfalls as well, which was very evident, especially in the new Hollywood cinema. They all started with a bang. Okay, this was the Journal of Films, Kair du Cinema. I keep talking about this, but just to repeat, just to refresh, launched in the 1950s and it was a journal uh, of French films, very respectable journal. The policy was put into practice by the filmmakers of the French new wave of the 60s. Uh, the idea was to go against the studio system and big budget films. The idea was not to rely on big stars and the idea was not to follow the genre conventions. We know what's, what are genres? Do we know what are genres? Categories. So, that is a very simple definition of genre. So, Scarface is a gangster genre, okay. but uh, genres are also much debated, contested uh, uh, categories, okay, because now we talk about uh, uh, genre ben blending and genre bending. So, if you want to read a very uh, scholarly book on genres, you must read a work called Film Genre, it is by Rick Altman, Rick Altman's Film Genre. And one uh, characteristic feature of uh, the author theory was that uh, um, the style becomes independent of the story. So, style was extremely important. Remember Bonnie and Clyde, you must watch Bonnie and Clyde and then understand how important style was. After all, it is just a gangster film okay, and it combines features of love story as well, but then it was the style of the movie in which it was shot. 
that became important. So, when Ranjit tells you our Atiya theory is based on a signature style, actually is the way you shoot the movie, the, the way you present a movie. Some directors were known for shooting the film uh, in natural lights. Okay? For example, if you watch a movie like Macab and Mrs. Miller, Warren Beatty's uh, film, which was shot uh, out and out in Vancouver and uh, um, directed by Robert Altman. And Robert Altman insisted those days, in the early 70s, that he is not going to do any dubbing for the film. Everything has to be in sync. Now, what happens when you are, when everything is in sync and when you are shooting in cold, extremely cold climes of Vancouver in Canada, wind blowing throughout, what happens to the sound? Muffled sound. Okay. And even today, even with the restored version, Macab and Mrs. Miller have a very odd sound to it. They all liked it when they first made it, because they thought that they are authors, you see, complete control of the way. This is the way we want the movie. Okay. But the audiences were so put off, no one ever bothered to watch the movie, although it is now considered a classic. It is a cult movie, it has recovered its cause, because uh, it was so appreciated for its style, but then it did not make any money for the producers. Okay. So, author theory and its pitfalls. Okay. So, coming back to what uh, Kaya Du Cinema told us, for an author film, there is no pre-existing pre story. The writer, the director has complete control over the material and they believed in improvisation. Okay. So, if the director is not happy with the way sun is setting or the moon is rising, they would not shoot the scene. And they would just keep on improvising it till they get that so called perfect shot. And the bottom line was that that director is more important than anyone else on the set, including the stars, including the producer. Okay, so, uh, just to encapsulate, yeah, uh, Othier's theory rejected the cinematic practices of the 1950s. They believed in making low budget films. They shot on locations with new or non-professional actors, challenged the studio system and of course, preferred natural light to studio light lighting and preferred natural sound to extensive studio dubbing. So, that is the takeaway from today's class. We will continue tomorrow. Thank you very much.